Welcome to Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written. We're glad that you could join us for a brand new study where for the next 13 episodes, we are going to be diving into one of the most significant and important subjects in all of Christianity. We are looking at the great controversy. What is it? Why is it important? And why is it important to you and to me living today? We're going to be finding out in the very, very near future. We're glad that you are with us. But before we begin, let's start with prayer. Father, we wanna thank you for being with us today. And as we delve into this very significant subject, we ask that you would guide our study of your word. And through it, may we understand better who you are and what your plan is for us and for the rest of your children as we look forward to that great day when Jesus returns. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. And we are grateful during the course of this entire series of studies to have with us Pastor Mark Finley. He is an international author, speaker, evangelist, and former speaker director of this ministry, It Is Written. Pastor Mark, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Thank you, Pastor Eric. You know, it's so exciting to participate with It Is Written. I spent 14 of the most uh, precious years of my life at It Is Written. We look back at very fond memories of our time there, and we're just excited to be with you. Anytime we can work together with It Is Written, that's what we want to do. Well, thank you again, Pastor Mark. Uh, it's always a blessing to have you here on our programs. We're looking at the Great Controversy, a very significant subject, an intensely and immensely significant subject. Why is that? What is the great controversy and why are we going to be spending 13 episodes looking at this very important subject? Well, the great controversy is the theme that really ties the entire Bible together. When you think of this great controversy or conflict between good and evil, we think first about God creating angelic beings with the freedom of choice. And then one of those rebel, one of those angels rebelling against God. And so this great controversy starts in heaven. It is then transferred to earth as Adam and Eve disobey God. And down through the Old Testament history, we see this conflict between good and evil, between the forces of right and the forces of wrong. Jesus comes and the controversy intensifies, particularly at the cross, where Satan does everything he can to destroy Jesus. But Jesus, our sin bearer, bears the guilt and shame of the sins of the world. And then is marvelously resurrected after his death on the cross and serves in heaven as our great high priest, giving us strength in the great controversy between good and evil. We look down through the Middle Ages where truth was compromised and on to end time where God will restore that truth and the ultimate coming of Jesus and the restoration of a new heavens and a new earth. So the great controversy goes from the rebellion in heaven, Eden lost, down through the centuries, to Eden regained with the new heavens and a new earth. So it is that overarching theme of all of Scripture. So this overarching theme of all of Scripture that we're going to be delving into, this is something that, that you've been studying for a long time. And we see the world that we're in right now and the challenges that we're facing. How long ago did God impress you that this subject was something worth diving into? How did we end up with it in our hands today? And why do you think it really is important for people living today all around the world to grasp this important subject? Well, when I was uh, when went into ministry, I began to sense the importance of this great controversy theme. Uh, it's unique in all Christianity, really. Uh, it put it ties the Bible together. And um, I've been in ministry 57 years and so been preaching on the great controversy theme. But here's the unique thing. This in 2024 and 2025, Seventh-day Adventists have a massive project of distributing the book, The Great Controversy by Ellen White. There'll be millions and millions distributed there will be hard copies in the full edition. There will be online editions. And I was asked to prepare the Sabbath school lessons based on the book, Great Controversy, but anchored in scripture. So every lesson is biblical. 
Every lesson has its foundation in scripture. But something unique that we've done with this quarter's lessons is we have listed the chapters from Great Controversy that that biblical lesson is based on. So it is a very unique series. I have to smile a little bit. You know, I've written now, this is my fifth Sabbath school quarterly. And um, the General Conference President, Elder Wilson, called me and he said, Mark, I've got an assignment, but but it's kind of an interesting one. I said, yes, Elder, tell me. He said, well, the timeline is is quite quite short because usually we have two years, two and a half years to write the lessons. And he said, Mark, we got about three months, but we need a series on the great controversy. Can you write it for us? Well, you know, it takes about 15 hours a lesson, about 200 hours to write it. And I didn't have that time just sitting around. But when my dear friend Elder Wilson asks me for something like that, and uh, I put everything else aside, basically, and uh, wrote the series on the Great Controversy in about three months of time. And so I'm just so thankful for that privilege because it is such a vital, vital scene, particularly for those of us that are living in the last days at end time, because prophecies are being fulfilled all around us that we find outlined in the Great Controversy. So very significant subject for us today. Um, we, we are living in those days. I want to drop into the first lesson uh, in this quarter's study guide. It's called The War Behind All Wars. Why did you choose that title to launch us into this 13-study journey uh, on the Great Controversy? Sure, The War Behind All Wars. When you think about it, what really is behind every war from the battle that took place in heaven to all of the Old Testament struggles between Israel and the Amalekites and uh, the Jebusites and so forth. What, what, what's, what's behind all those wars? What's behind every war today? It's selfishness. When you look at, at the origin of war, they usually come because of selfishness. The pride of nations, the desire of would-be world rulers to, to rule, to control. And so the war behind all wars is that war that began in heaven when Lucifer rebelled against the government of God. And he did so filled with pride, filled with arrogance, filled with this desire to dominate. So the basic philosophy of war is domination. The war behind all wars the great controversy between good and evil is Satan's attempt to dominate and to take the rightful ruler of the throne, Jesus Christ, off the throne. So Satan's desire is to dominate, evil's desire is to dominate, has been since, well, the beginning of rebellion and that, that selfishness. You know, one of the, the big questions that a lot of people have today is, if God is supposedly so good and so powerful and so wonderful and so loving, if he's so good, why is this world so bad? And, and how are we going to be answering that question as we go through this quarter's lesson? Well, Pastor Eric, you know, you and I do a lot of evangelism. And that's one of the questions we get very often in evangelism. If God is so good, why is the world so bad? Why does a loving God allow so much suffering in our world? When God created angelic beings and God created cherubim and seraphim and all of his creation, he gave to them freedom of choice. Now, let's suppose that God did not give his beings freedom of choice. If you take away freedom of choice, you take away the opportunity to love. And if you cannot love, you cannot have fulfillment or true happiness. When you give the freedom of choice, you run the risk of beings making the wrong choice. But God respects the freedom of choice because that's what it makes, that's what makes a human being, the ability to choose. That is what allowed heavenly beings to be higher than simply mere robots or automons, um, mere puppets. They had the capacity to choose. So the reason there's so much suffering in the world is that in the power of choice comes the ability to make the wrong choice. And when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they opened a door that God wanted forever shut, the door of sickness, suffering, heartache, and evil. 
when Lucifer rebelled in heaven, he opened a door that God wanted forever shut. And that door was the door of suffering and death. God is the author of life. He's the author of all the good things that happen to us. Satan is the author of death. You know, it says in John 10, verse 10, the thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come, they might have life, they might have it more abundantly. So the power of choice is one that God has given to us, and he invites us to reach out to him, to make those choices in harmony with his will that will lead us to be the happiest beings. Here's a little something that I have found very helpful for people. You do not judge God by the events that are taking place in our world. You judge the events that are taking place in our world by the character of God. Since I know God is a God of love, therefore I interpret all the events that are taking place in our world through the lens of the fact that God is love and that Satan is destructive, wants to destroy. So when I see events of sickness, suffering, heartache, and death, I know that that's not God. First John 4, 8 says, for God is love. I know those are Satan's attempt to destroy because we're in a planet in rebellion. I think you hit on something very, very significant, very important there. And it's, it's important that not only we grasp that, but that we have the ability to share that concept with others, that God is He's not the author of evil. He's not the author of all the sin and the death and the destruction, the disease that's out there. But sometimes we get that proverbial cart before the horse. Now, Pastor Mark, if somebody wants to dig more deeply into this subject, this immensely important subject, there is a companion book to this quarter's Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. And that book is called The War Between Good and Evil. You wrote that companion book. What is in that companion book and why would somebody want to pick that up in addition to the study guide? Well, the Bible study lessons have an outline of each of these 13 chapters that take us from the fall of Lucifer in heaven to the destruction of Jerusalem, right down through the New Testament period, the Middle Ages and the end of time. The companion book rounds out a lot of that historical material it goes much more deeply into the biblical material. And there, and what I've tried to do, particularly in the companion book, as we get into the last chapters, weave into Adventist history. So there's wonderful lessons from Adventist history throughout the companion book. And then there are entire sections on end time events. So if you want to be prepared for the coming of Jesus and know more clearly the end time events, companion books for you. So where can you find that companion book? It is very easy. If you go to itiswritten.shop, again, that's itiswritten.shop, you can find that companion book. The author is Pastor Mark Finley, and the title is The War Between Good and Evil. You want to pick that up to give yourself even more depth of understanding on this critical subject. And speaking of this critical subject, we are going to come back in just a moment as we continue taking a look at the great controversy here on Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written. We're going to be right back. If you'd like to deepen your understanding of the powerful themes brought out in this program, we invite you to explore the book, The Great Controversy. For more information, simply text the code GC24 to 71392. This book delves into critical end time themes offering profound insights into historical events, Bible prophecy, and spiritual preparation essential for today's unique challenges. Discover how the great controversy can illuminate your path in these uncertain times. It's everywhere, adorning churches, adorning people. There's a season every year commemorating the cross. But beyond eggs and rabbits, there's a power, the power of a sacrifice, the power of the love of God. Be sure you see At The Cross and learn about the single event that changed the course of history, the event that can change your life forever. Predicted by prophets and foretold by Jesus Himself, what happened at the cross was a demonstration of God's love like no other. Humanity's fall into sin in the Garden of Eden brought upon Adam and Eve and their descendants inescapable consequences. But into that turmoil stepped Jesus, promising the planet a way of escape. Don't miss At the Cross. 
brought to you by It Is Written TV. Welcome back to Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written. We are taking a look at the great controversy, an incredible theme that goes throughout Scripture, and we are just getting into it right now. Pastor Mark, I want to ask you a question. In, uh, in Monday's lesson, you introduce the war in heaven by quoting a passage in Revelation chapter 12. It's verses 7 through 9. I'd like to read that and then give you an opportunity to respond to it and share why you thought this passage was important. In Revelation 12, verses 7 through 9, it says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So that sounds important, but why is it really, really important? I think, Eric, this is one of the few places in the Bible that clearly explain why this world is in such a mess. It's one of the only places in the Bible that explains what happened in specific detail in heaven. When you look at the text itself, war broke out in heaven. That's a strange place for war. You'd never think that there'd be war in heaven. But this war in heaven is the war behind all wars, as we title our lesson. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, the dragon and his angels. So you have, you have two sides. You have this battle. Sometimes people ask me the question, was this a physical battle or a mental one? Well, we might not have every single detail, but there certainly have to be certain physical aspects of it because it says they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them anymore in heaven. So they were cast out of heaven. So there has to be not only a mental battle, but some kind of physical battle. Every angel had to make a decision. And in the final battle between Christ and Satan at the end, every human being is going to have to make a decision. So there could be no neutrality, no walking the fence. Every angel had to make a decision. Then verse 9 is an interesting verse. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world he was cast to the earth and his angels with him. So the devil is called in this text the dragon and the serpent. He's the dragon because he destroys, the serpent because he deceives. He deceives those who he ultimately destroys and destroys those whom he has deceived. So here we have the origin of evil. Here we have the beginning of this battle, the first shots, if you please, in the battle between good and evil. Lucifer, a perfect being, created by God in an angel of dazzling brightness, rebels against God. He wants to sit upon God's throne. He wants to usurp God's authority. God works with him and labors with him and appeals to him. But Satan drifts further and further and further away from God. What this initial battle tells us is if the devil could deceive a third of the angels in heaven, and that's what the Bible says in Revelation 12, 4, says his tail to a third part of the stars of heaven. If the devil could deceive a third part of the stars of heaven, a third of the angels, we better reinforce our minds with the word of God. Be day by day seeking God in prayer because the devil is a deceptive foe and he'll breathe like a dragon at end time. We can be thankful that through Jesus, by Jesus, because of Jesus, we are protected and we can be secure in the hands of Christ. You know, Pastor Mark, you mentioned that the opening salvos of this great war were, were fired in heaven, but that war has most certainly, most definitely come down here to earth. And I want to kind of go over to the book of Genesis and look at some of the beginning of this uh, of this war here on earth in Genesis chapter 2 verses 15 through 17 it says then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it and the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden you may freely eat 
but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. What, what is the key principle that's exhibited in these verses, and why is it still important for us today? The key principle here, Eric, is that God has gave Adam and Eve the freedom of choice. Just like God gave the angels freedom of choice, God gave Adam and Eve the freedom of choice. He clearly explained that here's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You can eat of every other tree in the garden. So it was not that they could not eat of every other tree and only could eat of this tree. Not at all. God is a God of abundance. He gave them everything. They could eat of every tree. But this one tree they could not partake of. That would demonstrate their faithfulness to God, their loyalty to God, their acceptance of God's word. And so he gave them freedom of choice. Now, let's suppose God did not place that tree there. Let's suppose God didn't give them a freedom of choice. What would that have meant? The whole universe could have said, wait a minute, you're unfair. You're unfair. You gave us as angels freedom of choice. And wait a minute, too. Would God be satisfied with beings that were forced, coerced to serve him and had no choice? Certainly not. The key principle here is that God gave Adam and Eve freedom of choice, and he gives us freedom of choice. He'll not coerce, he'll not force, he'll not pressure. He gives us freedom of choice, but he lures us to him. He does everything he can to bring us to himself. So part of God's character of love is that giving us freedom of choice. He gave it to the angels in heaven. He gave it to Adam and Eve. Unfortunately, we look back at history, we find that not all of the angels in heaven exercised that freedom of choice wisely. Uh, Adam and Eve didn't exercise that choice wisely. If we're honest with ourselves, we haven't always exercised that freedom of choice very wisely. But Jesus did exercise it wisely. Why is, what is the significance of Jesus here in the great controversy? How is he the solution to this big problem that we find ourselves in? You know, right there in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, verse 15, God gave the promise that the Messiah would come. You remember that God told Adam and Eve, in the day you eat of this, you'll die. Now, the Hebrew language is interesting. Dying, you will die. Dying, you will die. So the death began that very day that Adam and Eve partook of that fruit. As Paul says, the wages of sin or death. So God gave a promise in Genesis that the Messiah would come. It says there in Genesis 3.15 that Satan would bruise his heel, but Jesus would bruise the head of the serpent, a deadly blow. Christ came and dwelt or tabernacled in human flesh. He lived the life we should have lived. He faced Satan's temptations head on and died the death that we should have died. So on the cross of Calvary, Christ bore the condemnation, the guilt, the shame of our sin. And so the significant thing is here is that in the great controversy, Jesus took upon himself the penalty of sin. And as he took that penalty upon himself, he died in our place. In his life, he gave us an example of the Father's love. In his death, he bore the guilt and shame of sin and revealed the depths to which love would go to redeem us. Pastor Mark, with that thought in mind, I want to read a passage from 2 Corinthians here. It's in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, and give you an opportunity to, to expound upon it. It says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's huge. That's immense. Christ never sinned, but he took upon himself the guilt and shame and condemnation of sin. Christ on the cross did not simply die the horrible, agonizing, physical death, as painful and as torturous as that was, but Christ died the second death. What is the second death? When do you die the second death? You don't die the second death after you die, necessarily. That's not the suffering of the second death, because the Bible says the living know that they shall die, but the dead don't know anything. Jesus died the second death as he hung on the cross with the hiding of the Father's face, 
bearing the sin and condemnation of the world, not seeing through the portals of the tomb, and apparently going into the tomb, bearing the sins of the world and the guilt and shame of those sins and the condemnation of those with the ability never to come out. Now, praise God, he did come out. Praise God, he was resurrected from the dead. But on those moments on the cross, he could not see that. He hung on by faith. So in 2 Corinthians 5.21, when it says, he who knew no sin became sin for us, he took the guilt and shame of sin, died the agony that lost sinners will die as he bore the sins of the world. He died the second death for us so that we didn't have to die the second death. He died the second death for us so that we could live eternally with him forever. Pastor Mark, I want to share one more passage of Scripture with you as we're, as we're drawing here to a close. This is over in John 17, verses 24 through 26. Jesus says, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. How does that give us a clearer picture of who the Father is, Pastor Mark? What a passage. This is Jesus' great intercessory prayer in John 17. And in his heart, you know, Christ dies. He's resurrected from the dead. And as he ascends to heaven before the Father, he says, Father, I will that those who you have given me be with me where I am. The desire of Christ is for us to be with him in heaven. The desire of Jesus is that every single one of us be saved. The desire of Jesus is not one of us to be lost. He has done, is doing, and will do everything possible to save us. That is the essence of his intercessory prayer. And a beautiful prayer it is, and a wonderful way for us to get started on this 13 episode odyssey through the great controversy pastor mark thank you for being with us this time and we're looking forward to you joining us next time as well and we want to thank you for joining us this is just the very beginning of a wonderful journey through a significant subject in fact some might say one of the most significant subjects in christendom and we've just begun we are looking at the great controversy past present and future and how it applies to you and to me today. So we're looking forward to having you join us again next time when we come together once again on Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written.